Okay, bye. Thank you. All right, so we want to again welcome everyone to our guest lecture series, continuing guest lecture series. It's uh, ChemSem 10, I believe. And today is it going to be a very important topic on PFAS, PFOS. Um, it affects things like firefighters, foam. Um, it's in fast food wrappers. So it's all around us. It's a nationwide pro environmental problem. And so we'll hear from Professor Ray today on that very important topic. As we normally do, however, um, one of our great students here at Andrews in our department will introduce the speaker. Today's introducer is uh, Isabella um, Tessely. So Isabella was in my um, OCHEM class, I believe last year. And one of the impressions I got from her is that she was really excited about doing the research, asked questions, came up with her own ideas and experiments to try. I like that. That's pretty cool. So she left a good impression with me. She's a, a biochemistry pre-med major, junior. She went to um, high school at Hill, Hinsdale Adventist Academy. Her hometown is Westmont, a suburb of uh, Chicago. Her plans are to become a pediatrician, a pediatrics, a doctor in pediatrics. And this is really interesting. You guys have to be careful. She could defend herself. Seven years of Taekwondo. Don't mess with Isabella. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a uh, privilege to have such great students here at Andrews. Isabella, it's your turn to introduce our speaker. Okay. So Dr. Jessica Ray received her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Washington University in St. Louis in 2009. She remained at Washington University in St. Louis and received her master's degree and a PhD in energy environmental engineering and chemical engineering. During her PhD, she employed surface chemistry techniques to investigate interfacial reactions of nanomaterials in water. She then moved to California as a Miller Institute postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California, Berkeley in the <laughs> Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Here she developed low cost polymer clay composites to treat urban stormwater. At the University of Washington, Dr. Ray is continuing to develop and characterize new composite materials for selective contaminant removal in water, for enhanced degradation of persistent contaminants, and for recovery of valuable species in waste streams. In recognition of her novel interdis interdisciplinary research addressing urban water supply and sustainability, Chemical and Engineering News named Dr. Ray one of the talented 12 honorees of 2020. Now, Dr. Jessica Ray is the Robert and Irene Sylvester Assistant Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Washington. And today she will be presenting to us on vanadium carbide nanomaterials for rapid defluorination of perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. The study of polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFA substances is important because of their ability to cause bioaccumulation of contaminants in the environment. PFA substances have affected the health of humans and wildlife. Dr. Ray aims to engineer more effective ways to treat water with these contaminants. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Ray. Great, thank you Isabella so much for that kind introduction and thank you all for the invitation to come speak at your uh, Going Forward Guest Lecture Series. So um, as it was mentioned, I'll be focusing my talk today on a specific contaminant, these uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS, which I'll talk more about in my talk and our unique approach to degrade these contaminants in water. Okay, so in environmental engineering, 
this is how we view our water supply in a linear approach where we take our drinking water sources, we clean that, send it to consumers. Um, once that water is used, it's sent to a wastewater treatment plant and it is eventually discharged. And we even view you know, storm water in this way, so, you know, a linear use to waste approach. But a more sustainable and circular approach would be to, uh, instead of discharging um, our treated wastewater, to treat it to a level that's safe to return back to the consumer for use. And that's going to be important in the future due to negative impacts of global climate change and increasing urbanization and population that are going to place a lot of stress on the drinking water supply. Unfortunately, there are challenges to envisioning or realizing this approach, and that is the presence of contaminants, which are particularly resistant and are able to you know, survive these advanced uh, wastewater treatment processes. And uh, those are the types of contaminants that I'm going to talk about today. And in my group at the University of Washington, we're called the Ames Lab, um, Aquatic Innovations in Material Science. And this is our approach to um, urban water supply sustainability is through the uh, lens of material science and development of these novel materials that can help um, address these concerns of uh, persistent contaminants in water supply. I'm also thinking about ways to recover valuable resources from water supply. So in our lab, we design, synthesize, and characterize these uh, low-cost engineered composite materials, and then we apply them to uh, various sectors in the water cycle and supply. Okay, so again, my talk today focuses on this piece, the presence of persistent contaminants that can persist even after you know, advanced wastewater treatment and also contaminants that are present in wastewater that is discharged. And those are the per and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances or PFAS. They are also dubbed the forever chemical due to their environmental persistence. So on the right here, you can see um, some examples of polyfluoral alkyl substances. And on the left, you can see examples of uh, common per alkyl substances. And I'll be focusing my talk today on the per fluoro alkyl substances and particularly this PFAS structure because um, what happens in uh, wastewater treatment is if you have these polyfluorinated compounds present, usually you can treat or degrade you know, this uh, kind of branch of the of the compound. And then what you're left with is something that looks more like PFOS and PFOA. And those we know are very persistent and um, are able to resist current water and wastewater treatment processes. So they will remain in wastewater that is discharged and in various drinking water sources. And the use of these compounds and the development of these compounds came about due to activities um, at military sites um, shown here, this is a naval aircraft carrier where firefighters are using this foam called AFFF, aqueous film forming foam, and these PFAS are the active ingredients in AFFF. So this uh, formulation was developed to extinguish fires uh, derived from you know, jet fuel or hydrocarbons, and firefighters would use this foam to practice extinguishing these, uh, these flames. And as a result, you get very high groundwater contamination of the foam, which contains the PFAS. So that was the kind of first uh, instance of uh, you know, contamination of water sources by PFAS. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not just AFFF where these uh, PFAS compounds can emerge. Um, the waxy kind of coating material on your microwave, inside your microwave popcorn bags, um, on the inside of some takeout, boxes, um, Teflon, the uh, abbreviation Teflon is from or uh, derived from a perfluorinated or polyfluorinated compound. Um, water resistant wear, which we have a lot of, you know, in Seattle, um, that historically was um, achieved by coating with a, a PFAS substance that was able to resist uh, water. You can also even find it on your cell phones because Again, these products are flame retardants, so they serve very useful functions for our daily life and, and different consumer products, but they are unfortunately very toxic and we need to treat them. 
And another bad, some more bad news, um, these compounds, as I've been uh, suggesting, are very stable. They are resistant to uh, biodegradation. They're resistant to, um, you know, abundant energy sources like UV light, which can degrade a wide variety of organic compounds in water. And they are also pretty resistant to traditional approaches used in water and wastewater treatment to degrade organic compounds as well. And this is a problem because of their uh, known negative health impacts if you are exposed to these PFAS. So here are some examples of um, ways in which humans are negatively impacted due to exposure of PFAS that can range from um, low birth weight and infant skeletal variations and deformations, um, kidney cancer, liver tissue damage, and um, negative impacts to your antibody production and immunity. And it's not just humans. Uh, PFAS can also bioaccumulate in frogs and other marine life. And because of these processes um, involved when you're exposed to PFAS, in 2016, the Environmental Protection Agency um, recommended that these compounds not exist in concentrations higher than 70 parts per trillion, which is really, really low. And um, from more recent news, it looks like these compounds will eventually be regulated. And this is going to be a problem for a lot of water and wastewater treatment operators because these compounds are starting to appear in not just these military training zones where they practice using the aqueous foam forming foam, but they're popping up all over the place in wastewater treatment, even in um, folks, you know, private drinking water wells at industrial sites where these consumer products are manufactured. And if you are a water uh, treatment utility or, or operator, you need to now regulate your processes um, in such a way that they can meet that 70 parts per trillion requirement. So that's going to be really, really difficult for a lot of operators to, to meet that requirement. Okay, so that was a lot of bad news. <laughs> um, how do we destroy these compounds? Uh, so this is a nice figure from uh, this Ross et al. Uh, paper in 2018 that is plotting on the y-axis the uh, different stages of development for different techniques that are meant to target PFAS. And on the x-axis, we have range of practicality, so from not viable to fairly feasible to, to do. And this talk is focusing on destruction of PFAS. So I'm going to block out all of the uh, like separation-based processes with respect to PFAS. And this is what we're left with. Um, as you can see, we tend to be in the middle here, except for these fungal enzymes are not very practical for large scale water treatment of water contaminated with PFAS. Um, incineration, where you can you know, burn off um, PFAS, say PFAS that is adsorbed to uh, some adsorbent. Um, however, this has been shown to promote the formation of hydrofluorocarbons, which are greenhouse gases. So that is not a very um, viable approach. Sonication can work, although um, it's a very energy intensive process and has been shown to be fairly inefficient with respect to complete degradation of PFAS. Electrochemical oxidation um, can work, but it's right now only able to treat very small volumes of PFAS contaminated water. And usually to achieve that, you need very expensive electrode materials. Uh, so far, the most promising approach is this combination of advanced oxidation and advanced reduction processes, AOP or ARP, um, because they're able to generate reactive species that are capable of attacking carbon fluoride bonds in those PFAS compounds. And this is um, what I'll talk more about later on in my talk. Okay, so. Um, more on these advanced oxidation and reduction processes for PFAS. So the focus for today's lecture or talk <laughs> is um, PFOS, the perfluorooxane sulfonic acid. Here's the structure shown here. So as you can see from this structure, PFOS, like a lot of the perfluoroalkyl substances, lack extractable hydrogen bonds that are, you know, the means by which hydroxyl radicals can attack organic compounds. So in water and wastewater treatment, um, usually the goal is to generate reactive oxygen species like 
uh, hydroxyl radicals and um, um, you know hydrogen radicals, other reactive oxygen species that are capable of breaking down different bonds um, within organic bonds. But because PCAS lacks hydrogen bonds that are easily attacked by hydroxyl radicals, you get really inefficient degradation of PFAS. Um, this study done by a guru et al. suggests that instead of generating oxidative species like hydroxyl radicals, what you should be trying to form in solution is uh, this species, uh, species excuse me, called solvated electrons, uh, abbreviated here. So if you generate these solvated electrons uh, here, uh, the AQ is uh, signifying aqueous electrons or uh, you know, hydrated electrons, that they are capable of reducing PFAS shown in this uh, mechanism here. So these solvated electrons are very highly reactive reductants that are capable of attacking uh, per fluoroalkyl acids in a couple of places, as you can see here from this figure, it's capable of attacking carbon fluoride bonds and, um, you know, excision of the carbon-carbon backbone within the PFOS structure. And here's some data from this same study. On the uh, top here, we see um, normalized removal of PFOS as a function of UV light intensity. So the way they're generating these solvated electrons in water is by combining UV light and a chemical mediator such as uh, sulfite. That's how they're generating the solvated electrons. And as you can see here, higher UV intensity results in uh, faster and more efficient PFOS removal. Um, and here on the bottom, you can see the uh, percent defluorination. So if you are in fact able to completely degrade a compound like PFOS, what you should generate in solution is a lot of fluoride ions that are released when you completely degrade the bonds within PFOS. But unfortunately, as you can see here, we're only about 60% efficient in terms of our ability to form those fluoride ions in water. So we need something else here, um, some other approach that could perhaps catalyze advanced reduction of uh, PFAS in water. And what we have been focusing on is the potential use of these reactive nanomaterials called maxines. And they are derived from uh, what are called max phase uh, metal composite materials. The M in max stands for early transition metals as shown in the red um, here in the periodic table. Um, it's sandwiched by an A group element, um, for example, aluminum shown in, in blue here. And then the bottom layer is um, X, which is either carbon or nitrogen. So if you apply hydrofluoric acid to selectively etch the aluminum layer, then what you are left with is called maxine. So, you know, taking away that A layer, you're left with um, an MX uh, composite material. Uh, so when you do that, there have been a lot of studies on, on these materials. They're fairly new. They were uh, discovered or formed in 2011. So compared to a lot of existing nanomaterials, they're fairly new. And they've been shown to have very fast charge transfer kinetics. You can tune the properties of this composite by adjusting which transition metal you use. Um, you can functionalize this material further without sacrificing uh, metallic properties that might be beneficial. So uh, this is something that you can't necessarily do as well with other nanosheet materials like graphene or graphene oxide. And because of their two-dimensional nanosheet uh, kind of morphology, they have very large surface area. So these are all great um, properties to have in terms of um, materials that you hope can promote uh, catalytic processes. And because of those uh, processes and properties of maxines, they have been mostly investigated for electrochemical applications. This is the one shown here in this figure where uh, maxine layers on conventional electrode materials can boost energy storage, say in ion batteries. And more recently, applications of these maxines have expanded from electrochemical applications to water treatment applications. So 
here are two studies using um, titanium carbide maxi materials. And you can see here in the top left, um, this study suggests that you could use uh, titanium carbide maxines to reduce bromate to bromide. And you can also use the same material to um, absorb and reduce copper ions in water. So if you study the literature for maxines that have been used for water treatment, you're not going to find a lot. This is still a very new application for these materials. And uh, vanadium carbide in particular is a pretty understudied maxine. Um, most of the work tends to be focused on these titanium carbide materials, but we were interested in vanadium carbide and I'll explain why later on in my talk. Okay, so these are the two driving questions for this study. Can we leverage the rapid electron transfer properties of these maxines to potentially enhance PFAS degradation or catalyze PFAS degradation? And in order to do that, we need to first understand or determine if these maxines will result in formation of these reactive species that we know to be capable of degrading PFAS, or namely those solvated electrons. Okay, so first what we did, of course, was make the maxine material that we are interested in. And um, as I suggested, we are interested in vanadium carbide. And um, here's a schematic of how this material is made. So as I described, you have um, these vanadium carbides uh, that are sandwiched between layers of aluminum. So here's what that looks like on the bottom left here at the end image. If you apply hydrochloric acid and you etch away the aluminum layer, then you are left with a kind of multi-layer vanadium carbide material shown here. You can kind of see the clearly the layers that are formed after you remove the aluminum layer. And then after that, you apply some organic solvent to uh, expand the spacing in between the layers. And then you gently sonicate and you um, can essentially form nano sheets as opposed to these kind of sandwich or uh, accordion like a structure and solution. So once we formed the maxine, we wanted to verify its um, morphology and, and crystallography. So we use x-ray diffraction, that's this texture shown here, of the different stages of uh, B2C nano sheet formation. So as you can see here, this is the, the bottom the spectra is for the, um, the starting material, the max phase material. When you etch away the aluminum layer, um, you get some peak suppression and peak shifting. And the peak shifting um, shown these little asterisks here correspond to a C lattice parameter expansion. So that is the expansion that results when you remove the aluminum layer. And then when you do the intercalation step and the sonication step to form the nanosheets, you get additional C lattice parameter expansion. And that, you know, we expect you're essentially just stretching the material to form these nanosheets. Um, we were also curious about its surface charge and solution. So on, the, on this figure, on the y-axis, we have the zeta potential or surface charge of the vanadium carbide nanosheets as a function of pH. And as you can see, over a very broad pH range, the material is negatively charged. And we weren't too concerned about this um, because it's very well known that absorbents like, you know, graphene, which is similar to um, these B2C nanosheets and activated carbon are very effective at absorbing uh, PFAS like PFOS, even though a lot of PFAS in water tend to be negatively charged. And so where you would expect electrostatic repulsion, um, the large surface area of these graphitic materials or carbonaceous materials are able to overcome the electrostatic repulsion and uh, result in absorption of PFAS onto those substrates. So we measured this, but we weren't really concerned about the negative charge of B2C. Okay, so after we confirmed the, I guess, correct synthesis and procedure of generating the nanosheets for the vanadium carbide, we wanted to determine whether or not it's able to degrade PFAS. So here's the first test that we did. Um, on the y-axis, we're plotting normalized P 
PFOS removal. And here we started with 50 microgram per liter PFOS in water. And we're uh, plotting this as a function of time. So there are a couple of uh, spectra or curves here that I will walk you through. Um, the first one, the first one is a blank. The blank is just PFOS in water. We wanted to make sure there was no loss anywhere um, along the way due to sorption onto like test tube materials or during PFAS analysis, which is unfortunately common with these compounds are pretty difficult to work with. So this suggests that we have negligible loss due to other you know, unforeseen complexities. When we have PFOS reacting with hydrogen peroxide, we can also see very negligible transformation or removal of PFOS in water. And we expected that because it's known that hydrogen peroxide, even UV hydrogen peroxide, is unable to degrade PFAS in water effectively. So we were expecting no transformation here. The red curve, uh, B2C, is B2C nanosheets in solution with the initial PFOS concentration. And we see here rapid uh, removal of PFOS as a function of time, and it kind of um, equilibrates after 30 minutes or so. And then when we add hydrogen peroxide to the vanadium carbide nanosheet, we see even more um, removal of PFOS and water. So eventually, after four hours, we get um, about 95% removal of PFOS. So this was promising, um, but right now we don't know if it's removal or degradation because you know these nanosheets could just be absorbing PFOS and water. We don't know if they're actually degrading PFOS. So in addition to measuring the PFOS concentration, we also measured con uh, the concentration of, of byproducts that could be forming in the system. So on the y-axis now, I'm plotting trifluoroacetic acid. Here's the structure shown here on the bottom right. And what you can see here is it looks kind of like a short chain PFAS, right? We have this fluorinated group here and this uh, carboxylic acid. And what we can see here for the same, um, the same systems where we have either vanadium carbide nanosheets in PFOS and water or vanadium carbide and hydrogen peroxide in PFOS and water, we see formation of trifluoroacetic acid. However, what you can clearly see here is that we have this sustained formation of trifluoroacetic acid in the system with vanadium carbide and hydrogen peroxide in the system. Whereas with just vanadium carbide, we have some initial trifluoroacetic acid formation, and then we have rapid um, removal of this trifluoroacetic acid. So this, um, this data is interesting because it suggests that we could be basically degrading PFOS to a certain extent, right? We're able to degrade the long PFOS eight carbon backbone uh, structure down to a very small compound, such as trifluoroacetic acid. Um, so that suggests that there is some degradation happening. Um, is it complete degradation? We need to determine that further. So to do that, we used ion chromatography, which is able to measure aqueous chloride ions in solution. And as you can see on the um, the y-axis here plotting percent dechlorination as a function of time that, um, oh, sorry, this is corresponding to the B2C H2O2 system. Forgot to mention that. Um, so as this data suggests, we have achieved almost complete dechlorination of PFOS in this system. And again, this is evidenced by the fluoride concentration that we're detecting and the fact that we are forming the short chain of PFAS in solution. So that was a very, very, oops, sorry. That was a very, very exciting um, observation for this study. And now we have the difficult job of figuring out what was going on in the system. So we wanted to characterize the vanadium carbide nanosheets further and try to figure out how the PFOS was being degraded. So to do that, um, we are getting at this question, what reactive species are formed and what reactive species are responsible for uh, mineralizing the PFOS in water. 
So to do that, we use electron paramagnetic resonance, which is a technique that is used to detect uh, radical formation in water. And what we observed here is that for both the vanadium carbide nanosheet and systems with vanadium carbide and hydrogen peroxide, we are forming singlet oxygen, which is one example of a reactive oxygen species uh, that, can, that can form during um, advanced oxidation procedures that are used in water and wastewater treatment. And we also uh, uh, form hydroxyl radicals in, in the system as well. And that's to be expected. Um, if we are adding hydrogen peroxide, we should expect to see some hydroxyl radical formation due to decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So this was an interesting finding for us. Um, we were expecting to perhaps be forming, you know, solvated electrons because as I suggested earlier, we know solvated electrons are very, very effective at uh, attacking different points of, you know, PFAS structure or PFAS in general. So where is this thing about oxygen coming from? Uh, to start to answer this question, we also measured X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy for these two reaction systems. And that data suggests significant electron transfer. So here are the spectra. On the top row, we have the vanadium 2p uh, spectra. And on the bottom row, we have the carbon 1s spectra. And XPS, if you're not familiar, is a technique that is used to measure uh, binding and oxidation states within your sample. So here's a table that corresponds to the different peak IDs that we observe here in the fitted spectra. You don't have to read this, but what it's basically saying is in the V2C um, sample, we start with vanadium-5 oxidation state. And then when we add hydrogen peroxide, the vanadium-5 is reduced to vanadium-3. And as a result or a combination of this process, the carbon within V2C is being oxidized in this process. So vanadium is being reduced, the carbon within the V2C structure is being oxidized. So we tried to dig around in literature to see if anything like this has ever been detected for either V2C vaccine or vanadium um, you know, structures or compounds in general, like if this was um, just an artifact, which we didn't think it was, but um, when we poked around in the literature, we found something interesting. And um, it relates to vanadium-5 electron uh, transfer or electron shuttling occurring in nature. And if you look at red and brown seaweed, they have uh, within their, um, within the seaweed, they have this enzyme called vanadium haloperoxidase. And here's a schematic of the enzyme, and I'll kind of walk you through this process. On the left of this uh, solid line, we have the electron uh, transfer and shuttling corresponding to the vanadium within the enzyme. The vanadium is the cofactor or center of this enzyme. And then on the right, we are showing here the products that are formed once this enzyme is activated. And this enzyme, is one of the first examples actually of vanadium being incorporated into biological structures. And this enzyme serves as a defense mechanism against biofilm formation. So what happens is you have a two electron halogen oxidation process. And the enzyme is going to um, you know, combine with hydrogen peroxide nearby and a nearby halogen, so bromide for example. And you are forming um, a hypohalous acid. So for example, hyperbromous acid, this HOX notation here. And um, this formation of this acid and other reactive species are able to attack nearby compounds like bacteria to prevent biofilm formation. And what you need for this enzyme to activate is a vanadium-5 coordination in your center or cofactor. You need the hydrogen peroxide and you need a nearby halide in order for this to work. So the activated halide, once the enzyme um, is, is active, is able to um, you know, become oxidized to form the hypohalous acid and attack the nearby organic substrate. That's this 
A pathway here. And in the B pathway, um, you can also get incorporation of a second hydrogen peroxide molecule to form singlet oxygen, protons, and um, release a halide, X minus. So in our system, we were adding in hydrogen peroxide and we observed the formation of singlet oxygen. And for that halide that we need, if you recall, when you generate the V2C maxine material, we used hydrochloric acid to etch away the aluminum layer. And what the literature uh, surrounding maxine um, formation and synthesis suggests is that when you use hydrochloric acid to etch away the aluminum layer, you get nanosheets that are terminated in fluoride compounds. And we've done pur um, purification steps to make sure we don't have a lot of excess fluoride that's trapped within the different, you know, B2C layers, but there is some residual fluoride present. And this may be that nearby halide that's needed to, you know, complete a mimic of this vanadium halide peroxidase enzyme. And we're not the first to suggest this. There's a study by Natalia et al. that observed a similar mechanism for vanadium-5 or vanadium pentoxide uh, in particular, nanowires that were applied to this surface. And when hydrogen peroxide was added and bromide was added to the system, they did observe an anti-fouling activity or biofilm um, defense mechanism occurring in their surface because of a mimic of the vanadium halide peroxidase enzyme. So here's that mechanism again. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so First, to you know, indirectly verify that this was happening, this B pathway suggests that protons are released. So in that case, the pH should decrease if you add hydrogen peroxide. And we observe that in, in our reaction system. So this blue curve is just B2C and water. And then the red and black curves are uh, B2C and hydrogen peroxide. So once you add that hydrogen peroxide and or PFOS, you get rapid pH decrease. So that was one indirect measure. The second indirect measure, again, was that formation of singlet oxygen generation when you add hydrogen peroxide and also when you don't have hydrogen peroxide. This was an interesting finding for us, too. And then the last thing that we needed was the vanadium uh, electron transfer. So our XPS analysis suggested that vanadium-5 is being reduced to vanadium-3, and that two-electron transfer is, again, what is happening in that vanadium haloperoxidase enzyme. So these are all indirect measures of what we think is the biomimetic process that's happening, um, but it's, again, kind of a side, <laughs> a side note for um, this particular application because, unfortunately, we know that singlet oxygen and hydroxyl radicals are not able to degrade PFAS. That has been very well demonstrated in the literature. What we need instead are solvated electrons. So when we did this test one more time, um, using a different um, you know, characterization uh, kind of uh, conditions, we observed these like circles uh, here above these peaks, um, all those very noisy spectra that we are indeed forming solvated electrons in both the vanadium carbide nanosheet solutions and vanadium carbide nanosheet solutions when you have hydrogen peroxide present. Okay, so the formation of the solvated electrons we think is you know, what initiates the PFOS degradation because we know again from literature that with really without solvated electrons, you're not going to get that, that level of PFOS degradation that we observe in our study. So what we think is happening is that the vanadium carbide nanosheets are serving as a catalytic reactive center for PFOS degradation. So first, we suspect that PFOS adsorbs to the vanadium carbide nanosheets, and that, again, is due to the physical and chemical properties of the vanadium carbide in a two-dimensional nanosheet, so very, very high surface area. And it's also a carbonaceous nanosheet. And we know that graphene, graphene oxide, activated carbon are all very, very effective adsorbents for PFAS. So we think this is the first step of what's happening in our system. 
And then when you have just vanadium carbide and PFOS now at the surface of the vanadium carbide, we think this electron transfer process must be occurring to some degree because we observe the solvated electron formation in the absence of hydrogen peroxide. And we did see that trifluoroacetic acid byproduct formation in this system. So there must be some electron transfer, some, um, some shoveling occurring in that system in the absence of hydrogen peroxide. But to really catalyze this uh, reaction, you add hydrogen peroxide and that promotes rapid electron charge transfer kinetics that are able to increase the yield of solvated electron species and degrade the PFOS that's absorbed nearby. So again, we think the solvated electrons are attacking first and then the singlet oxygen and hydroxyl radicals that are also forming can more easily attack the byproducts that are formed after that initial solvated electron. Attack. And all of that is what is contributing to complete PFOS degradation in our study. So this is, we're still, uh, you know, working through this system. Um, I just got some new data for my postdoc today <laughs> that I put in the presentation. So this is still an ongoing process, but uh, for the first time, we observed that vanadium carbide nanosheet um, can be used to treat PFAS in water. So this was the first time that anyone's used vanadium carbide for water treatment in general, and the first time this material is being applied to PFAS. Um, this is also the first time that we are seeing a biomimetic process um, that's similar to that vanadium haloperoxidase enzyme activity being observed in vanadium carbide vaccines. And this is also the first time that anyone has seen solvated electrons that are being formed from maxine materials. So these are all firsts for this study. And again, this, uh, the use of the nanosheet uh, to catalyze PFAS degradation is really just you know, a heterogeneous support that is helping to promote electron transfer. And so this could be used to not only treat PFAS, but also other halogenated or persistent organic compounds in solution. Um, so some next steps for this study are to uh, understand the effects of other aquatic constituents like dissolved organic carbon that's been known to impact both adsorption-based processes and redox-based processes. And in thinking about how we scale this technology, right, because these are very small batch tests we are performing. We are, part, um, we are partnering, excuse me, with my friend, uh, Professor Tarpe at Stanford, and he is, does a lot of electrochemistry. So we want to harness the innate um, properties of these vaccines, which had been used for energy storage applications to now degrade PFAS in water electrochemistry. So that's the next step or the advanced move for this study. Okay, so um, with that, um, I hope you can see from this work um, that we are basically looking at this large picture of urban water supply sustainability and how to address the presence of those very persistent and toxic contaminants and thinking about new exciting opportunities to create uh, solutions that can um, start addressing these problems in order for us to arrive to more sustainable processes in the future. So right now we're focused mostly on contaminant removal in my group, but in the future we will move to recovery of value added products as well. So um, that's it. And here's uh, funding sources for, for this work and uh, my research group that and my postdoc UMA, I, I will say, is uh, the one who has done all of this work. So special shout out to her. Um, I think that's it. I'll take any questions we have now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Ray. So uh, are there any questions? You guys, again, as usual, can put questions in the chat. You could unmute yourself, ask the questions. Um, I have questions to begin if uh, no one else at this point. Um, several things. Uh, first, let's deal with toxicity. What do we know about the toxicity of these 
vanadium carbide and not just vanadium carbide, but vanadium catalyst in general, I'm assuming you may also have some info on that. Uh, yep, good question. So um, vanadium, I can't recall the, um, the, the MCL for, you know, vanadium in water, but yes, to a certain um, degree, vanadium can be toxic. Um, if you um, are exposed to it or ingest it in water. However, we are using very small doses of these vanadium carbide materials to degrade PFOS. So much lower than levels where you would start to exhibit toxicity to either humans or you know, aquatic life if you were to um, discharge you know, uh, this PFAS treated water that may have residual vanadium species in the discharge water. So we have, we're at low levels and our hope is by shifting to this electric chemical application, we can eliminate any um, you know, leaching of vanadium or exposure to vanadium by fixing the vanadium carbide onto the electrode surface. Okay, okay. And any uh, questions? <clears throat> I have one. It's a pretty simple one, actually. I don't know much about uh, vanadium in terms of an element or where it's found in the earth and how it's mined. Um, okay. Is ben vanadium a, a common element? Um, uh, and uh, does the mining of it actually uh, perhaps uh, cause some environmental damage at uh, where it's mined? I'm just curious about the sort of the the life the, of a vanadium sample? Where does it come from and where does it go to? Right, yeah, also a really good question. So um, vanadium can be found um, trapped in different minerals. So that's, um, that's the most abundant source, I would say, of vanadium is actually, um, again, I forget the name of the the minerals that um, contain vanadium, but um, mm -hmm. you can have um, weathering of those vanadium bearing minerals that will release vanadium in, in water. And that is how it's believed vanadium was incorporated into red and brown seaweed to, um, you know, to form this vanadium haloperoxidase enzyme to begin with. So mm -hmm. that bioincorporation is, is also a fairly new discovery. But yeah, the vanadium, um, it's not, I guess, being mined. It's, uh, you can find it, you know, in the environment, uh, naturally in forms of minerals. And you can find vanadium also in some consumer products as well, like for um, health supplements, actually. So that also suggests that, you know, it's uh, not extremely toxic if they are selling like vanadium um, found, you know, supplements. Yeah, wow. Okay. Is it, so is it, uh, Novak, do you maybe know it's a, is it a trace mineral? Like some oh, mineral? Yeah, it's definitely a trace. Oh yeah, it's trace. It's trace, it's, yeah. okay. As, uh, I don't, I've not seen it any, any um, mammalian systems that I know of okay. um, at all. And I, this uh, enzyme in the algae was the first I, I've even heard of uh, that happening. Although for the people who've had biochemistry, I want you to note what amino acid side chain the vanadium was connected to, and it was histidine. Histidine, you see histidine all over in human biochemistry. So mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to see that. Yeah, right there. That's a histidine side chain. Mm -hmm. uh, plays in a, a role in the active site. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious about the bonding that's happening in this vanadium um, carbide. Uh, my just simple speculation, which could be totally off, is that it's a linear type structure that's kind of- Caught a little bit of your question. Uh -oh. Something it's crazy just happened. <laughs> yeah, it um, cut off and then cut right back on. Anyway, um, I don't know what's going on, but the I was thinking about the structure. Um, 
to me, it's kind of reminiscent. It says my internet connection is unstable. Huh. Um, it's, it's sort of reminiscent of like an aline. Um, carbon dioxide would be a simple one with the carbon in the middle and the two vanadium double bonded on the end. Is there any work on or understanding of what this uh, vanadium carbide bonding might be? Um, let's see. So let me go back to the um, So the vanadium carbide within the max material, you mean? Yeah. So like the starting material that we use. Right. Yeah. Um, so when we use material, we we start with with this phase, which is um, synthesized in the lab. So the, the processes by which you generate either vanadium aluminum carbide or titanium aluminum carbide or other um, max phase structures that could then be um, etched to form vaccine uh, structures. That's a very, um, it's a complicated setup for us to achieve. We don't have a lot of the equipment needed to do that. There's this kind of centering process that occurs um, where you are able to promote binding of vanadium and carbide or titanium and carbide with the aluminum interlayers. So um, that process we don't, <laughs> we don't do right now, at least in our lab. If we functionalize the material in some way, we would have to start from the um, generating this phase to begin with, but that's, you know, in the future for us, um, more immediately, I would say that our group is trying to find a way to remove the aluminum layer without having to use hydrochloric acid. And, you know, in a lot of material science work where you need to um, clean silicon wafers or other surfaces for you know different electronic applications. It's very common to use hydrochloric acid, but for environmental applications, especially with water treatment applications, we want to get away from using <laughs> hydrochloric acid. It's pretty scary to use in a lab. So um, we are also actively looking into new ways to more safely generate the vanadium carbide material. Okay. Other other questions? My internet connection is just totally unstable. I don't know what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> I also had another question too about, um, so you taken a, a hydrocarbon, it looks like in one of the mechanisms for the halo peroxidase and uh, generating alkyl halides uh, you're breaking a carbon hydrogen bond and forming a carbon. Is that in any way a radical type mechanism involved? Uh, do you want to type your question, perhaps? You're still breaking up pretty bad. I'm still breaking up really bad. Oh, my goodness. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so is uh, radicals involved? Uh, radicals involved in the. It seems more stable now. <laughs> is it better now? Ask your question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, no. Are you, are you hearing me now? Sorry. I thought. Uh, yes. Okay, are radicals involved in um, in that mechanism from taking a hydrocarbon to a, a alkyl halide? Um, so the the process on the left really is identifying how the vanadium um, cofactor or center is undergoing a um, a conformational change um, due to this electron shuttling when you have hydrogen peroxide present and a halide present. And then 
on the right are the kind of byproducts of the enzyme cycling where that halide that's used um, are combined with the hydrogen peroxide to promote the vanadium um, conformational change results in the formation of a hypohalous acid. Um, it results in the in this B pathway of the formation of that singlet oxygen radical species that we identified in our system. Um, and then in terms of the degradation of a nearby organic compound, uh, that's this A um, uh, pathway here. So that hypohalous intermediate can attack a nearby organic compound to um, oxidize it and, and degrade the biofilm that's trying to form on the seaweed nearby. But you also, if you incorporate more hydrogen peroxide in this B pathway, you do form the singlet oxygen uh, species, reactive species. Okay. Dr. Randall has a question. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my question was, yeah, there was this uh, spectrum with this, uh, it was an x-ray spectrum, uh, I think a scattering spectrum that with the, the x-axis is two theta. Oh, yes. I forgot what the name of that one is. X-ray diffraction. <laughs> How yes. it works. Yeah, so um, with x-ray diffraction, the two theta corresponds to, like if your sample is, here, the two theta corresponds to the angle by which the x-ray is um, interfacing with your material. And um, depending on the, the lattice um, framework within your inorganic material. So x-ray diffraction really is a mineral phase identification technique. So your sample that you're measuring needs to be inorganic and have some sort of uh, crystallographic structure associated with it. Because when you um, change the incident angle degree, so the two theta um, axis, you are going to have different um, diffraction or scattering of the incident x-ray with the position of the atoms within the lattice structure. And so when you get um, kind of a direct hit of the x-ray with um, an atom within the lattice structure, you get a really sharp peak. And then when there's no um, atom nearby as the, uh, as the x-ray is scanning your sample, then you get the kind of baseline here. So um, if you do this enough for a lot of inorganic materials, you can build a reference library, which um, you can use to then match against the sample that you're trying to measure. So we use this x-ray diffraction technique to, uh, for the max phase material to verify that, you know, at least our starting material has been synthesized properly. And then when we do the etching steps and the nanosheet formation steps that we achieve spectra that is, you know, comparable to what's been observed in literature for others who have also performed x-ray diffraction techniques. And this um, information of peak shifting and stretching and peak suppression we can use to gain information about how the uh, crystallographic structure of the vanadium carbide is changing with respect to the different treatment processes that we're doing with it. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Yeah, my, my group, we do a lot of, um, because we're building these composite materials, we do a lot of surface chemistry analysis like the X-ray diffraction, X-ray scattering. Yeah. A lot of that <laughs> in our work. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. That was good. And I can see how it'd be very useful to, to characterize the, the materials. Yes. Okay. Anyone else has questions? All right. Well, we um, will go ahead and thank you again, Professor Ray, for a great seminar. At least it was insightful. I learned stuff. <laughs> that I didn't know about vanadium chemistry here. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing some of the successes you have in this research. We might have you come back. Great, I love that. Thank you so much for having me. Okay then, have a great evening. Thanks, you too. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.